a few times. <coughs> Steve, would you come and preach? <coughs> I know, only kidding. So, <coughs> new year, new way. Let's talk about embrace suffering. Embrace suffering. As much as I love Dr. Ed Boy, as much as he makes me smile, I don't get overexcited when it comes time to go see my dentist. As much as I needed my hips replaced, I can assure you the day before surgery, or the day of surgery actually, I wasn't jumping for joy and couldn't wait to get there. You see, that's a little bit like how I view the sermon subject this morning. Embrace suffering. You dread suffering like the Dickens. When it comes, you can't wait until it's over. You dislike it passionately while it lasts. But when we look at suffering in the context of a successful faith journey, we really do see the need to embrace it. Not like it. Not love it. And certainly don't want no more of it. But embrace it, learn from it, grow through it, glorify God in it, and become better in spite of it. Embrace suffering. There is nothing you can say that will get me excited, looking forward to go, and can't wait to get to the dentist. But... If you can point out the benefits, if you can explain to me, <clears throat> help me understand the importance of having oral health, I'll grin and bear it. <laughs> eh, you missed that one, that's okay. <clears throat> I'll grin and bear it, kick and scream at every red light and intersection as I get closer, but Dr. Boy, here I come. Because someone has explained to me, has made me aware of the benefits of having oral health. Anybody with me? I ain't going to make me like going there anymore, but it is going to help me to embrace my appointment rather than fake it and call in and say I can't make it or something. Now, don't expect me to have bells on. I'm not going to be walking through the door whistling and singing. I just feel like something good is about to happen. I'm not going to tell the receptionist, honey, I am so glad to be here. No, I'm not going to lie to her, but I am going to go. It is not the Holy Spirit's objective this morning to get us excited about suffering. And I want you to hear that. The Holy Spirit is not going to try to get me and you excited about human suffering. No, he isn't. I don't expect that the sermon's end for you to be in a most jubilant, elated mood. I'm learning, in order to adequately embrace suffering, we must become more about the journey than we are the destination. Ponder for a moment. Pastor, how, and it, ha, human suffering, and you're asking and you're saying, if you, if, if you can embrace it, and I'm saying to you, I'm learning, not haven't learned it, I won't be writing a book on it anyway soon, but I am learning that we can embrace suffering more if we become about the journey more than we are about the destination. On the faith journey... I want to get there as soon as possible. Amen? I want to get there as soon as possible. If God says, okay, uh, next stop is destination B. All right? Uh, well, I, I, hey, let's go, God. Come on. Let's, let, let's go. So, so I want to get there as, as soon as possible, and I want to get there as easy and as convenient as it is imaginable. So I want to get there as soon as I can, and I want to get there with as much comfort as I can. Amen? 
Now, again, that's how you are, that's how we are. And God understands that, and that doesn't bother him. But you see, on the other hand, God wants you and I to, en- he wants to enjoy the journey with us. He, he likes, he, listen, he, he likes being at the destination, celebrating with his kids, but he loves walking with us on the journey and getting there. You see, God is about arrival. Listen up. God is about arrival, and since he is eternal, he is more about arrival condition than he is arrival time. Oh, God wants to get you there and wants to get me there. But God is eternal. And since he is, he's not worried about how fast we get there. Come on, amen. He's not worried about how convenient that it is for us while we travel. He is concerned about going with us and how we arrive. And can I tell you something? His ultimate objective in arrival, if you want to say, well, okay, what is that condition? And that condition is holy. He wants you and I to arrive more like, oh, listen now. He wants you and I to arrive more like his son than when we began the journey. You see, <clears throat> I like to travel the freeway. Not really. Sister Brown likes to travel the freeway. We always flip a coin when we get to Springfield. Are we going interstate or are we going the scenic route, 68? She cheats, and we usually go the freeway. I like to travel the freeway. God always chooses the scenic route. The scenic route? <laughs> Because on this scenic route, there is some bumps in the road. Now, there's bumps on the freeway, too. I, I, I don't deny that, huh? But, hey, you, you know, you're going 75, and you don't feel them as bad, right? And, uh, and, but but, but, but there, is some, there is some curves. There is some curves. There is some, there is some bumps. There is some railroad tracks. There, there is some obstacles on this scenic route. Amen. But you see, the reason that God likes to go the scenic route is because when you hit a bump, when you cross a railroad track, when, 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 the, when you hit something uh, and, and the front end of your car does this, you are always learning and becoming more like Jesus Christ. And he loves that travel, and he loves what's taking place while we are uh, suffering. Uh, God is about re- uh, revival. Um, so, so here's what I'm saying. If you'll learn to enjoy the journey more, you'll embrace suffering easier. No, not, okay, so we're traveling the scenic route. God's not about me getting there as soon as I can, uh, as convenient as I can, huh? God is about me getting there holy. God is about me getting there, being more like his son Jesus when we arrive than when when we left. That's what God's concern is. And so if I begin to embrace that, if I begin to see the value, like I see the value of oral health, therefore I go to my dentist as much as I dislike it. I begin to see the value of traveling the journey and enjoying the journey with God. It does help. I ain't got it down pat, but it does help to embrace suffering because you're going to see something here in a moment. Uh, we walk with God uh, because we can't wait to get to the destination. God walks with us because he loves making the journey with us. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to travel with him, you're just going to have to go his way. You know? Amen. I always want to take the freeway. I told you that. God likes to see the crowd. I want to get there so I can be there. God wants to get me there so we can be together. God wants to go with me there so we can be together. So think about how many jobs, churches, marriages, challenges have we walked away from because the suffering, the hardship, the pain of the journey? Uh, uh, To quote Ed Green in his sermon last time he preached, and I quote, we got rolled up in self-pity when God allowed adversity, the reason, uh, when God allowed adversity, comma, the reason adversity was allowed so God 
could show his glory through us. So how many times have we forfeited God getting glory because we have absolutely no tolerance for godly suffering? Now remember, God gets most glory when you are more like his son. Amen? Okay, just keep that in mind. Uh, so think about this. Did we walk away from a God-ordained context of suffering that the Father had planned to use in teaching us, growing us, and polishing us? You can count on it. You can count on it. If it is for God's glory, it will ultimately be for your good. Think about this. Think about this. Now, before you dismiss that as a possibility, uh, I want you to listen to what the apostle says. Now, I want you to know, the Bible says, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel, God's glory. As a result, it has become clear. It has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Huh? See, in suffering, remember, there are some things happening to us today, so there can be some better things happening for us and around us tomorrow. You see, without Jesus' suffering death, there would have been no resurrection. Speaking of the dentist... Earlier, back a couple months ago, uh, I spent better part of uh, a Saturday suffering in the dentist chair so I could stand up here on Sunday and smile and preach to you. Because I promise you, if I had not spent about three hours in the dentist chair on Saturday, now there might have been somebody smiling and preaching, but it wouldn't be me smiling and preaching. Now, get this and don't miss this. More often than not, in the economy of God's kingdom, it takes one to make the other happen. I can tell you this. The man and the woman that God uses the greatest... Listen, I'm not talking about the one... That maybe is on the stage the more. I'm, not ta I'm talking about the man and the woman that God uses the greatest is the man and the woman that has allowed God to hurt them the most. If you will embrace the suffering that comes your way, you are going to bring God glory you, you're, going to bring, you're going to bring good news and blessing to other people. You're going to bring God glory. You're going to bring good news and blessing to other people. And you are setting yourself. You are building a context, shall we say. You are building a framework that will bring blessing and prosperity to you and your family and to everyone that you have contact. Check it out. Check it out. If you want to talk about Old Testament Joseph, if you want, I, who, pick them, pick you one. And I'm just telling you, those that would embrace what the world put upon them, God may not have caused it, but he allowed it. Come on. Those that would embrace it are the ones that brought greatest glory to God and, and brought blessing and prosperity Think about Joseph to a whole nation. But don't forget, that boy spent 13, 14 years in prison, wrongly accused. Now that hurts. I'm pretty sure it does. Well, so I want you to hear this. Again, I'm not trying to get you to get in a good mood about suffering. I'm just trying to get you to see the value of embracing it and quit taking the exit every time it comes your way. Because God is building something. He cares about, He loves you. 
He died on the cross for you. He's, put, he's bringing his plan about for you. And I know, just like for me, just like for you, man, when it's hitting home, it's hard to take. Come on, amen. <clears throat> now watch what Paul writes. <clears throat> I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. So if the likeness of the blessing of Christ is on your horizon, then go ahead and put suffering on your agenda. Because you're not going to have one without the other. Until we have suffered for him and with him, we don't know his character and we don't know his heart. In other words, the depths of our knowing is casual and surface. This explains why worship is often no more about the reaction of my mood. Usually that's what worship is, is consists of. The reaction of the mood that I'm in. The reaction of where the worship team or the leaders, those that are facilitating, can take my emotions at the moment. That's usually what worship is, consists of. And I'm here to tell you, that's very casual and that's very surface. Worship has got to become about his worthiness of adoration. And can I tell you, his worthiness of adoration is discovering in his faithfulness in you suffering. Gosh. I don't guess I better climb on one. Since the sister's here. Did you hear me? When is it that I discover that he is worthy of my adoration and worthy of my service and worthy of my worship? When do I discover that? Not when I am on the mountain flying high, but it's when I'm hurting. It's when life is killing me and I get to experience the faithfulness of the Savior. And my friend, when you experience that in the valley, in the hardness of life, you come in this place, they can sing, oh, MacDonald had a farm, and you're on your feet saying, hallelujah to Jesus. And on his farm, he had a lamb. I'm going to make you spiritual. And that lamb shed its blood. All right. Do I need to say more? Okay. I'm learning that homegoing celebrations, in fact, if you're up to it and you're, and you're okay with it, if you have a Christian loved one that goes on to be with Jesus, I would encourage you to make worship and celebration a premier part of that gathering. I know we get quiet in funerals. Come on, amen. And I understand it's a, it's a subdued time. But I want you to hear something. I want you to hear something. So if we can have in homegoing celebrations of Christians and a, a, a premier place to reach levels and degrees of worship that we would not reach in regular church settings, it's because there is an authenticity in worship that rises from suffering. Think of it this way. The woman who gave the widow's might and the Pharisees who fill the offering plates with abundance. What got the attention of God? The widow's might? Well, I want to tell you all something. You get yourself in here when you're hurting you get yourself in here when the world has just beat you up. You get yourself in here when you've taken a licking and you're still ticking for Jesus. Come on, amen. You get yourself in here when you're suffering and you're hurting and life is at, at, a, at a very distasteful place for you. You get yourself in here because your worship will draw the heart of God on this place. Suffering is inevitable. Suffering is inevitable. It's built into the framework of God's plan for every one of his kids. 
God may not always cause it, but He always uses it for good in His glory. It is better for us to embrace suffering than to resist it. Our attitude of embracement towards suffering goes a long way in where our suffering takes us and what our suffering does to us. Boy, I hope you hear that. Because I'm going to tell you something. Suffering can take you to a bad place. In fact, I'm just going to just be just real candidly honest with you here. Most of us, suffering initially takes us to a bad place. Now, if it, you, you, you say, well, mine don't. Well, just hang on. Hang on. Amen. <laughs> but I'm here to say suffering takes us. Hey, hey, when, when, when you just got hit with more than you can handle, when, when, when the life is just gone from you, because of circumstances and, and things that have transpired in, in your life. Uh, and, and, and you've been victimized by culprit after culprit. And, and, and it can take you to a bad place. But boy, in that place... If you can do as Job did, he embraced his suffering. And he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know why this is going on, Lord. I can't give an explanation of any of this. I can't, I can't make sense. It's nonsense to me. But God, if this brings you glory, I am in it for the ride. Come on, amen. Come on, amen. Come on, amen. I can tell you my shocks is wore out. Not my socks, my shocks is wore out. My shocks is wore out. My setter has set and it's sore. Come on, amen. Amen. I, I can tell you I, I've had about all that I can handle. And I come before God and I say, God, when does the resurrection happen here? And heaven is silent. Anybody with me out there? Anybody? Am I talking to anybody but myself? Heaven is silent. And I come to a painful conclusion. God, if this brings you glory, then I'm signing up for the rest of it. Because I can trust you, Father. I can trust you. If you died and if you love me enough to die, I know I can trust you. And I may be in Joseph's prison now, but one day I will sit in Joseph's palace. Good Lord, I hope it don't take 15 years to get me there. Or 13, whatever it was. Suffering is inevitable. Uh, it, it, again, so it takes you to a bad place. I'm telling you, it's taking you to a bad place. You may find yourself in a bad place this morning. But come to the Father, and real quick, we're going to talk about that. So in other words, resist to fight God on the promises, on the premises of your whys for suffering makes the ride rougher. Y'all know that, huh? Y'all know that. If you, can, if you can move from why God, and, and it's okay to be there. Do you understand that? It's okay to be there. You don't throw God off. You didn't surprise Him. When, you, when it hits you and it hits you hard, it takes you there. Come on, amen. But as you are pouring out your heart and you're crying out to God and trying to make sense of the nonsense, can you, can you evolve to a place? God, if this brings you glory, then I'm going to reluctantly sign up for the rest of it. But I'm in. But I'm in. And I'm going to tell you what. That don't mean the ride becomes easy. It does mean it is not near as rough a ride when you embrace what the Father has in store. Well, so, so we, don't, we don't need to pray for suffering. I know you, don't, you know that. You don't need to ask for it. Uh, don't go out and look for it. No, no. See what? Well, pick, pastor preached on something. What are you doing today? Ah, after church, I'm going to lunch, and 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 I'm and I'm going to go on a mission. I'm going on an adventure. Well, what kind of adventure are you going on? I'm going on. I'm going to go out and look for some suffering. No, it'll find you. 
Don't need to look for it. You don't need a good coon dog to find it. No, come on. But when it comes, and it will come, you're going to see something here in a moment. In fact, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, when it comes, okay, embrace it. All right, so here's Peter's insight. 1 Peter chapter 4, are you there? It'll probably, it could be on your screen, I don't know. 1 Peter 4, 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude. Peter later in that chapter, uh, well, he goes on and he says, well, Peter later in that chapter writes this in verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So, what's Peter saying? Peter's saying, don't be surprised. Don't let it catch you off guard. Okay, so when suffering happens, we say, well, I didn't see that coming. Peter is saying, live with a sense it's coming. Don't let it catch you off guard. Uh, so you go out and you buy a new car. How many of you, you go out and you buy a new car and you set it up on payments. And, and so how many of you just lose your mind uh, when, 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 when the bill comes in? You say, I need to talk to you, Pastor. I, 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 can you hook me up with a therapist, a Christian counselor? I, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm just absolutely, I'm absolutely, I've, I've just, I, I, I'm, I'm just can't, I can't handle this. I can't handle whoa, 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 what's happened? What's happened? Well, I bought this new car last month, and, and I got a bill for my monthly payment. That's exactly what Peter is saying. Peter is saying, you signed up to follow Jesus and you're freaking out because suffering has come your way. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, don't, don't think it's strange. Don't think it's unusual. Don't, don't, don't lose it when it comes your way. In fact, he says, arm yourself uh, with the same attitude that as Christ suffered, you will suffer. Uh, so Peter says, live with a sense it's coming. Don't, don't let it catch you off guard. There's nothing wrong with you because this is happening to you. Oh, how many times have I went down that road? <clears throat> In fact, there's a lot right about you for the reason that you get to experience a small part of what Christ suffered a whole lot of. Did you catch Paul? Paul realized the value of suffering, and he said, oh, that I can experience the power of his resurrection and that I can participate in his suffering. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm taking it on the chin. The devil is beating me up and I'm hurting, but I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm one of his kids, huh? Amen. Yeah, just go ahead and tell your neighbor, say, hey, 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 the devil beat me up, but, but, but Jesus thinks I'm hot stuff and I can handle it, and here it is, uh, you know. Yeah, amen, amen. I'm so special, I get to suffer for him, amen. And sometimes you say, I wish I wasn't so special. But just, that's, he's father, he loves you, he loves me, and I know he knows what he's doing, and I can trust him. Uh, so, you're not weird. It's not because you have sinned as the devil is telling you and you're believing him. Come on, amen. In fact, listen to what Peter says in the next verse. Uh, because whoever suffers in his body, it's 1 Peter 4, uh, whoever suffers in his body is done with sin. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Watch what he says. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. I'm going to tell you what, this is about one of the most exciting passages of Scripture that I've come across in a long time. Hang on, I want to show you this. One of the enemy's greatest means of leverage getting us to sin is getting us to, and getting us to ignore God's will is deceiving us into believing His path has much less suffering and inconvenience and discomfort. He wants to try to convince you and I, if you would hang out with me and quit, that, and quit that Jesus stuff, you'd have life a lot easier. Now, now, hang on. Is that not what he says? Come on, amen. Uh, that, that's what he says. Now, watch this, though. Watch this. Don't, don't miss this. He uses suffering of doing right to steer us away from doing God's will. 
He uses the suffering of doing right to steer us away. In other words, he's saying, if you'd hang out with me, it wouldn't be happening to you. You wouldn't, you, no, 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 no. See, he uses suffering as a leverage to get you to ignore God and to sin and, and to follow your de- human desires. Amen? Oh, but wait, watch this, watch this. But if we can embrace suffering, it takes that leverage away from Satan using it against us. So, uh, listen to what the Bible says. Uh, Peter writes this, For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Watch now. Meaning, if you're willing to suffer for doing right, you have made a break from sin's biggest selling point. In embracing suffering, you have diluted the devil's glaring ability to lure and entice us away from the Father's will. If we're willing to embrace suffering, not like it, the devil can't paint following God so bleak and desolate. So the devil comes along and says, says hey, hey, you know what? If you, if you give that deal up and quit that Jesus stuff, and, and uh, life would be a lot easier. And, 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 and you just simply say, you know what? I, I, really, I really don't mind the suffering too bad because I know where it takes me. And I see what it gets me. And by the way, you're a liar and the father of it. Okay. And so this is what Peter's trying to say to us. He's trying to say to us, if you'll embrace suffering, and there's some other things, but if you'll embrace suffering, you can take away some of the leverage that the devil is using against you to walk after your flesh. Mm. Okay, so, so if we're willing to embrace suffering, uh, yes, God does and can use uh, uh, suffering to strengthen our moral character. He does. And there's no question the fires of suffering purges the vessel, bringing more clearly the image of Christ for the world to see. But in the text, Peter mainly wants us to have the attitude, a willingness to embrace suffering removes one of sin's most powerful means of leverage. So let me see if I can illustrate If I didn't have such a craving for sweets, extra pounds would not be much of a problem for me. Hang on. Listen. If being comfortable wasn't one of your addictions, Satan would be less a problem for you and me. Man, I'm just telling you, I grew up in the same America you did. I was born in 1958, Eastern Kentucky. Great place to live. Great place to be. I got spoiled just like you did. Come on, amen. And God says, in my economy, I do things a little different than what you're used to. You know, my dad and mom did, they, they, my dad and mom did a great job raising me and my brothers. They did. But my dad made one, 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 one fatal mistake. And maybe yours did too. My dad would say something like this to me. Now, Gary, I want you to go to, and my brothers, I want you to go to grade school. I want you to go to high school. I want you to graduate. I want you to go to college. I want you to get you a good job. And uh, that's good. That's good. But then dad would say this. You already know what he's going to say, did you? Because I don't want you to have it as hard as I did. Dad, that's a mistake. I told you, I told you, I wasn't planning on getting you in a good feel mood this afternoon after this is over. I just want to help me and you to embrace what the Heavenly Father sends our way. Because I'm going to tell you something. God will bless you, but God won't spoil you. Do you know what made my dad the man he was? 
He had a father that was in World War II who left his kids when my dad was eight. And my dad had to run the farm at eight years old. And my grandma and his two older sister, the younger brother, was too young. My, my, dad, had to, my dad had to be a man. My, my, my dad had some really hard stuff in life. And I look back on my dad, and I'm here to tell you, that's what made my dad who he was in character and integrity and with a work ethic that, is out of this, that was out of this world. Can I, can I tell you something? Oh, man, I'm really going to mess up here. I have grandkids, and I hope my daughters are listening to my sermon today. I, I, I do believe, I don't think that we should let people bully our kids. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Don't let people bully your kids. Come on, amen. Get, the, get mama bear going, papa bear going. Don't let people bully your kids. Let me tell you something. It's okay to let your kids hurt occasionally. Because if they're going to follow Jesus and get into this blessed life, he's going to let the hammer drop on them. Well, anybody with me? All right, all right, all right. So, 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 if, if I wasn't so, uh, if I didn't crave sweets, uh, I, extra pounds would, wouldn't be much of a problem for me. If being comfortable wasn't such an addiction uh, in American Christianity, Satan would be less of a problem. Uh, he would lose significant leverage. So let me put it this way. When, I, when I'd rather do good than feel good, when posture of character means more to me than the pleasure of life, I am no longer an easy prey for the roaring lion to come after me. If doing good means more to me than feeling good, the devil just lost a page from his playbook against me. If the posture of character means more to me than the pleasures of life, the devil just lost another page of his, uh, in his playbook to come after me. When your integrity means more to you than fuzzy feel-goods, you throw a clog in the devil's machinery. When leaving a legacy for others to follow means more than your personal gratification, you took some bark out of the devil's bite. Come on, amen! When you don't have to be liked and when being popular is not your priority and when being comfortable and when having it your way is not life's mission, you limited the devil's playing field against you. Oh, he's still coming! But boy, you threw a cog in his wheel. When being right with God means more than feeling good, you just rip some pages out of the devil's playbook against you. Rejection. Nobody in this room hates rejection more than me. Rejection takes us back. But when rejection doesn't throw us off track, our comeback is quicker and easier. It hurts to be rejected. Amen. Everybody hurts when they get rejected. But when it don't throw you off track, your comeback is easier. Put suffering on your agenda and rejection while it will distract you. When you embrace it, it will not throw you off track. Oh, he'll find some way to come against you. He always does. But by preferring will, God's will over comfort limits his enticing toys, his lurking trinkets. Uh, notice verse 3, uh, and I'm almost done. For, for you have spent enough time, watch what Peter writes here. For you have spent enough time during what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. So why should Peter's readers not take the pleasure of being governed by human feelings rather than the will of God? Peter says, you have spent enough time living after human passions and desires. Even though Peter doesn't ask them, so let me ask you. In those times of living after human desires and passion, how did it work out? And we'd all say, not so good. Not so good. So, so maybe there was some pleasure in sin for a season. But the season will end and the hard winter comes. And now living governed by human feelings and desires is rough and it leaves you hopeless. Do you know why people are living hopeless? It's because they're living after human desires and after their flesh and after their own will. They're ignoring God. They're ignoring what's right. They're ignoring Jesus. They're ignoring what he has for them. And beloved, it always brings misery. Misery. 
Don't suffer for doing wrong. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Don't create your own trap by being governed by human feelings. Like Peter said, there will be suffering from that. Amen. So the last verse and I'm done. So then he says in verse 4, those who suffer according to God's will commit themselves uh, to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Come on, Jeremy. Now listen, if you're following God's plan and you're suffering because of it, hold steady. Don't you dare let suffering throw you off course because of your human feelings and your desires. Because who don't want to feel better? And who don't want it more comfortable and more convenient? Who wants to go drinking this cup of suffering? If it be possible, Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. There you go. I'm telling you, this suffering comes to an end. It may be Friday. It may be Saturday. But I'm telling you, your Sunday is coming. And as you are suffering, it is pressing and pushing you in to the kingdom of God. So if you're following God's plan and you're suffering because of it, hold steady. Don't let the suffering throw you off course. Amen. Amen. Your resurrection is coming. But if you're not following God's plan and you're suffering, repent. Because it ain't going to get no better. Now hear me, if you're not following God's plan, if you're ignoring Jesus Christ, then repent and repent now. Because I promise you, it won't get no better. If you're suffering for Jesus Christ and you're following His plan, I promise you, it will get better. You know what? You might even write a song after you get through it. You might even write a book after you get through it. But I want to tell you, you will get the attention of the masses because you've been there, you've done it, and you're wearing the t-shirt, and you're loud and you're proud that Jesus was faithful. Every step of the way. He was faithful every step of the way. And I look back over my life and I see sometimes one set of footprints, Lord. You've heard it. One! And it seems that those were some of the most painful moments and seasons of my life. Where were you, Lord? Lord. And the Lord said, oh, come on. I was carrying you and those were mine. <clears throat> it's okay if you need him to carry you this morning. Come on. Come on. Absolutely, come on. It's okay. He's had to carry me. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess probably he's going to have to carry me some more. So it's okay if you need him to carry you right now. It's okay, come on. Let him carry you. Let him carry you. Cry out, scream, kick, whatever you need. Just let him carry you. Because I'm telling you, he's going to take you to a place that you have never been before. You're going to, you're going to exalt the name of Christ. You're, you're, going to, you're going to spread the kingdom. He's going to take you places. He's going to do things with you and through you. 
He, he's he's going to, he's going to, he's being glorified. He's putting his plan together. He's building the framework right now. And boy, every, every nail, every, every hammer hurts. Let him carry you. But don't you let your suffering cause you to change courses. If his plan, if his will changes courses uh, as you follow him, absolutely, surrender to his will. But Peter says, don't let your suffering cause you to change course. Commit to him and stay the course because it may be Friday. I hope it is Saturday at 1159. But I'm telling you, 